Hello, we're back again. Uh, I was just saying that this is an absolutely amazing format and hopefully I at least will get better as we go on with this. But um, I'm so glad you're all here and our presenters have been so incredibly generous with their time and expertise. Uh, the next presenter is Melissa Williamson. Uh, Melissa, now Dr. Melissa Williamson, is a, an early childhood consultant, has been in this field for a long time. And um, she is also co-chair with me of the Early Care and Education Sector Work Group for the South Texas Trauma-Informed Care Consortium, trying to bring uh, trauma-informed care and uh, other uh, curricular and practices to you all who are with children in the most formative years of their little brains. So, uh, Melissa, we're happy Hi, to have you. Thank you, Kathy. It's certainly my pleasure to be with you all and, and my pleasure to be with everybody out there. What a response we've had to an early Saturday morning. And Kathy and I were talking um, backstage, if you will, in the green room, just talking about the, the crescendo of important topics that we've had today. So it's my pleasure to bring to you today trauma-informed care in the early childhood setting. As Kathy did mention, I am um, a project manager for Frog Street Press. Frog Street is a curriculum, early childhood curriculum company, as well as adduct adjunct faculty at the University of Texas at San Antonio. So I would like to first say thank you to Voices for Children for um, allowing this kind of event to go on. I know that sometimes um, it's hard to get these things put together, so I honor your commitment to early childhood educators. And guys, we've had you just listen to a wealth of knowledge from um, the doctor to Marta talking about domestic violence. And one of the things that I wanna share with you today is that um, in my presentation, you're gonna hear and see a lot about advocacy because as early childhood educators, as center directors, as nurses, as teachers, as licensed professional counselors, and as parents, because I know we do have some parents listening today, it's up to you to work towards advocacy. And advocacy um, in this profession is really important. So when you think about the word safe, what kind of, what, jot down what comes to your mind. And I'm gonna tell you, I am gonna give you some homework because 45 minutes isn't near enough time to um, get out all that we need to today about this topic. Typically when I spend um, time on this topic, I spend time, I spend an entire six hours with a, a school or a center or administrators talking about this. And so um, get your phones out. You can take some pictures of some slides that I, where I have homework assignments, but this is the first one. I want you to jot down when you think about the word safe, what comes to mind, particularly in our industry in early childhood education. I think people think about things like asthma care. We think about, especially in the days of um, that we're living in now, right, in the days of COVID and how our world has changed, you really think about those kinds of things. But do you often think about social and emotional safety? And that is what um, I want to talk with you about today. We're going to learn a whole bunch of stuff and you see it there on the screen. And I think one of the things that I've picked up from the theme of today, and you know, Marta put it really eloquently when she talked about domestic violence and the impact on children. I think we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about trauma-informed care and adverse childhood experiences. So first of all, what's your role? Many of you, like I mentioned before, are early childhood educators. You're in the classroom day in and day out. Some of you are leaders in schools, you're leaders at your center, you're leaders in the classroom as a teacher, as a provider, as a caregiver. Some of you are in the helping profession. 
when you think about your role and what it is designed to be and what you have made it, how does adverse childhood experiences and trauma-informed care fit into that role? And secondly, I want you to think about if you're in a serving profession, and many of us are that are on this webinar today, what are the goals for those that you serve? And why, in, when you thought of that goal uh, for someone that you serve or the community that you serve or the center, or the classroom that you serve, or even your family, if you're a parent listening today, what are some goals for, for your family? What are some goals for the kiddos in your classroom? And how does that intertwine with this topic of adverse childhood experiences. One of the things that you're going to hear um, from me today is, is some personal stories. And um, some of you are gonna text me and email me and, and say that um, I, I probably need to go to therapy and I probably do. But um, I think that when I talk to you about my personal experiences with this particular topic, one of the reasons is, is that I'm so passionate about it because I have had some personal experiences with it. Secondly, as Kathy mentioned, um, I recently finished my study and the study that I completed was on all about family self-efficacy and teachers in a role of educators of families. The family portion of that particular study made me realize just how important this question is to me as a goal for those that I serve. In that study, what I found was parents and the parents that I interviewed are longing to find out information about adverse childhood experiences. And I had <clears throat> several parents come back and tell me, and I'm paraphrasing from their quotes, just how important this information was to them when they learned about how their actions truly impacted the lives of their children, it changed the way that they did things. When they learned how they could take their own CD-ROM, as Dr. Becky Bailey calls it, and change that CD-ROM from the things that they learned from their parents to how they were parenting now, it changed the trajectory of their child's life. And for me, that's part of the reason why this topic is so important to me. I, in fact, changed part of my CD-ROM. Early on as a young parent, um, I. You know, my kids laugh all the time that I actually uh, talk about this topic. Though supportive, I wasn't the best parent early on. I made a lot of mistakes. And now this is the way that I give back to right all of those wrongs. And I think when you think about your goals as an individual of uh, educator or whatever your role is, to children and families. You have to think about it like that and why are you gonna be so passionate about that? And then finally, I wanna ask you, what do you know about the subject? What do you know about the topic? If you don't know a lot about the topic, you're gonna to learn just a little bit with me here this morning. But I ask that you consider broadening that information, broadening your, your knowledge because the more knowledge you have, the better, skilled you're going to be when it comes to really changing the lives of children and families. And if you're a parent, that goes for you too. Um, you can also broaden your knowledge. And as Kathy mentioned, um, I do co-chair the Early Child Care uh, Task Force part of the sector with her. And I think that one of the things that we're so proud that we've been able to do in our community here in San Antonio, Texas, is to to bring together people who have the um, authority to talk about this kind of taboo topic, if you will. Who wants to air that bad things 
happen in the lives of young children? Who wants to air that bad things have happened in our own lives? And I think we have been able to bring together a group that has brought out how important this topic really is. And we share it in our community colleges. We're now sharing it in our universities. We are sharing it across professional learning opportunities with schools and communities. Um, I'm going to be able to share it with, uh, with over 3,000 people um, out of an organization called the Council for Professional Recognition next week out of Washington, D.C. that has asked me to speak on the same topic. And I think as we go through um, today's presentation, think about what you know, think about what you need to learn, think about who can give you that information and where you're going to spread it. Will it just be in your own household? Because that's an important place to start. Or will it be to a broader community um, like what we do today? And, and that broader community can be your friends and family on social media. So let's jump into it. So what is adverse or what are adverse childhood experiences? Sometimes you will understand that this is called ACEs for short, and we like to, to um, use acronyms. So adverse childhood experiences have been defined as abuse, which you heard a great deal of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction um, stories from Marta uh, previously. But I think one of the things that you have to remember is that there can be slight variations of all of these. And when I, when I think back to household dysfunction, you know, for those of you who uh, know my family, I, I want to share with you that I uh, was in a blended family, right? We were not the Brady Bunch, however. Um, my mother had me um, and she married the man that I know as my father when I was three years old. And as a result of that, we became this blended unit. And the blended unit came with four other siblings that were um, probably some of them, not probably, some of them are closer in age to my mother than my actual father was. And so you can imagine the kinds of dysfunction that that might have created because there was a divorce on, on that side. And so even though they're subtle, they still can be considered adverse childhood experiences. And then you have your more, your way more extreme kinds of things, right? And then you also need to think about these kinds of things, natural disasters. So I did um, two days worth of work with an organization in Houston that experienced this great, the flood. And we've seen hurricanes and we've seen all kinds of natural disasters in um, our nation those too can have an impact on children. What I heard from some of the teachers in Houston was that when it starts to even rain, the behaviors in the classroom really, um, for some children, get uncontrollable. And it's that, that sense of, I remember when, or my brain imprinted when, it rained that time and we had to walk through the streets um, that were flooding, we lost our homes, all of those kinds of things. The other thing that we have to remember too, and it doesn't matter what side of the political aisle that you live on, is that children, um, of, uh, children and families who are trying to come to the United States who are often separated, that too brings about some dysfunction, right? And what they have to do or what they're trying to do to get here um, often is, is tragic. We've heard many stories here in South Texas about what happens to them. And then this is your very first homework assignment. This is a video that I want you to watch. It is on YouTube and it's called, How Does Toxic Stress of Poverty Hurt the Developing Brain? We understand that not all families who are experiencing poverty experience um, 
adverse childhood events. But what we do know is that poverty can compound sometimes in some families, if there isn't that resilient buffer there, it can compound this. And so it's a great video. Unfortunately, we don't have time to watch it today. And then finally, we have seen this. My husband keeps threatening that he's going to get this um, tattooed on him. We have all seen this image, right? When we think about COVID and we think about, I was listening to a broadcast earlier in the week and one of the presenters talked about this. And what when she was talking, she talked about thinking about it broadly. It is impacting all of our families different. Some of the children that you cared for in the past are gonna come back to your center with a parent, a grandparent, a relative who have been infected and have gotten better, right? Have gotten well. Some of the families are gonna come back to your center who have lost someone. Not to mention, when I go back here and I think about the economic impact that this virus has had on families, it's sheerly tragic. We have taken, uh, families who were working every day and those median income families, and they've lost their entire income. And I'm just thankful, and I know that, that most of you out there um, are too, that we live in a country where we're banding together, that you see neighbors helping neighbors, that we have community supports. I know the city of San Antonio has done a fantastic job in supporting each other with food, with now just yesterday with um, rental reimbursements. But when I think about this, I think about um, what the long-term impact of something like this pandemic is going to do um, as we move into years later and understanding how that had an impact on children. And so for those of you who are dying to know, do I have any ACEs? This is a, another one of your homework assignments if you wanna do it. This is a free screener that's available to you. And I really like this screener. It was put out by National Public Radio and um, Kathy in her work in Voices for Children and the fantastic um, Saturday opportunities that they bring to the San Antonio community. A lot of the work that they've done is centered around trauma-informed care and adverse childhood experiences. And she's given this um, quiz out in, in paper format. And, and we've really seen how a lot of us have many adverse childhood experiences, right? And so this is just a free screener. Um, you know, it's, it's one that if you leave around your house and you ask your kids as they're young adults now, you know, you might find out some information about what they were thinking as did they ever have any adverse childhood experiences? Um, let's say I, I, um, I found out about mine that just that way. And so after you um, take the screener, the other thing that I want you to do is it's important that you understand as an adult how childhood trauma affects health across a lifetime. And Dr. Nadine Burkhair, she's one of the leading experts. And I put this picture up here because this is the video that I want you to watch, the one in the red dress. I tell everybody that all the time. And the video is titled, How um, early childhood or how childhood trauma affects health across a lifetime. And what you're going to hear her say is that adverse childhood experiences and ACEs are very common. You hear me talking about some of the things that I experienced. You're going to hear me talking about how they had an impact on my family. But what we understand now from the research is that people with four or more ACEs are three times as likely to have lung disease. They're 14 times more as likely to have a number of suicide attempts, four and a half times more likely to develop depression, 
11 times more likely to be a substance abuser. And then obviously some of those kinds of things create liver disease and, and heart damage and, and all kinds of things. So what you need to understand as an adult doing this work is that how your life was as a child and the impact that it has on your health across a lifetime. And then how are you going to think about things differently? What are some of the things that you're going to change in your life? What are some of the things that you're going to change in your classroom because of the knowledge that you now have? So I want to share with you, um, my friend and colleague Jody Martin shared this particular website with me. And it's a website out of um, the UK. And they have entered into an initiative, and it's the 7030 initiative. And so their goal is to reduce adverse childhood experiences by 70% by 2030. And when you think about that, I think about, as Dr. Nadine Burke Harris refers to, it's a movement and they have created that movement. We have created that movement here in San Antonio and many other communities in Texas and many other communities across the nation, that movement to reduce adverse childhood experiences. And for you as the individual watching today, I ask you to think about what part of that movement are you going to be involved in? Is it going to be in your own home? Is it going to be in your classroom? Is it going to be a personal movement because what you experienced as a child? So let's talk about, and I want to show you, this is a real picture that I'm really proud of. This is a school that I worked with for the better part of three years on the topic of family engagement. And these are parents and teachers working together in a professional learning activity. I said that right. These are parents and teachers learning together in a professional learning activity or professional learning training session, whatever you want to call it. And what we talked about that day was language development. And so together, we were, I was able to work with this particular um, program and we, we taught the teachers from the very beginning, took two years, about the importance of engaging families. And I, I want you to think about whatever program that you're in today, how do you engage parents and families? Because I'm telling you, if, if this time is not, um, has not opened our eyes to the importance of that engagement, um, nothing else will. And then I wanna ask you, as an early childhood professional, we're going to switch gears now. We're going to start talking about how important we are as early childhood professionals and how important you are and how important you are to the lives of children and families. You need to think about who we are in this industry. And just like many of you, I started out in that classroom. I, my very first job was a um, I was a two year old teacher and I had a mentor teacher. And her name was Miss Vivian. And Miss Vivian taught me um, lots and lots of things about children. But mostly what she taught me is that she created a safe, secure environment for the children that were in her classroom. And so I've grown up, so to speak, in, in this particular industry and so have my, my own children. And so when we think about early childhood professionals, what I want you to think about is how you can begin to advocate for the really important job that you do, because it is now time. We're seeing the results of years and years of work in the media now. We're having parents understand what we do, that we're not daycare providers, we're not babysitters, we are early childhood professionals and, and we need to advocate for ourselves and we need to make sure that other people hear that. And so 
when you look at this particular slide, there's a huge gap in, in what we are paid as early childhood professionals to teachers and elementary teachers and kindergarten teachers. And a lot of that has to do with education, right? But what I ask you to think about is are our teachers, our, our degree teachers, bachelor degree teachers, those working, uh, those of you who are working in elementary school, how do you also feel about your wages? It's not enough. And now is the time for you to begin to advocate because people are really listening. They're really hearing how important your role is as an early childhood professional and how important your role is as that elementary, middle or high school teacher. And so when you equate those particular wages and you think about poverty guidelines, often some of our early childhood professionals are living in poverty because of the wages that were paid. And so what you need to think about is what is my voice going to be able to do to help support an increase? And with, there's lots of organizations that can do that. And here's why I want you to think about that. So when you think about something called the windows of opportunity, and, and there's a fantastic video on YouTube and I didn't put it on here. It's uh, Dr. Pam Schiller talking about the windows of opportunity. And one of the things that she says in here and what we know about brain science is that early education matters. And here's why it matters. Because these windows of opportunity for all of these skills, all of the skills that help make you who you are as an adult today, the most fertile time when the brain is able to wire specific skills happens in early education. And I'm going to say that again. The most fertile time when skills are wired happens in early education and in early childhood. And if that isn't reason enough for you to stand on your soapbox and start talking about how much early care and educators matter and how much you parents at home matter to your youngest child. And I have to tell you, if I could go back and reverse time, this is one of the things that um, I think when I started this journey that really kind of hit me the most because did I do these things to optimally wire the brain of my own children? as best as I could, right? And I always joke and say, this is what I'm doing to pay it forward. I'm gonna right all my wrongs. But I, I think you need to understand that. And, and I know that you're not gonna be able to see part of this little thing on the screen uh, because of the pictures down there. Uh, but what I want you to understand is that adverse childhood experiences begin to occur in the first thousand days. This is from conception from conception because the child's brain begins to wire early in utero, early in utero. And this also um, really great quote by Dr. Schiller, what you teach me birth to three will be what matters most to me, but what you teach me when I'm three to five will be most likely what makes me thrive. 80 to 85% of a child's brain is wired by the age of three. 90 to 95% of a child's brain is wired by the age of five. And so when I think about my early childhood and how my brain was wired, and we don't have nearly enough time to go into that today, um, what I do think about is what impact that it had on me young and now how did what was that trajectory like and how did I transition that wiring into my own family and and I will tell you that it does transition and um, sometime when we have more time I can go into that but what I want you to understand today is that early childhood educators and parents alike you guys are brain architects we are brain architects. 
And not everybody understands that. And you're thinking, why on earth did this crazy woman put a picture of toothpaste on the screen? Well, maybe I you I always say when I'm standing up in front of audiences that raise your hand if you brush your teeth this morning. And, but I'm not going to say that this morning because some of you rolled over, you got your phone, you put your earbuds in and um, may not have brushed the teeth. But when you do brush your teeth, and I heard Dr. Jean Lee out of um, Harvard and formerly out of Fred Rogers Institute use this analogy. And what he said was, it doesn't matter what kind of toothpaste you use. And I tested out this for myself. What matters is there's only one active ingredient in that toothpaste. And those of you, um, you know, it's fluoride, right? So toothpaste has lots of inactive ingredients in it. It's got things that make it taste good. It's got things that make it bubble. It's got all kinds of other things. But the active ingredient in a child's life, there's only one. That one active ingredient in a child's life is you. And when you think about that in the terms of a classroom, the active ingredient in that classroom is the teacher. There's lots of inactive ingredients. You can have a great curriculum like Frog Street. You can have the best classroom setup. You can have the best design activities, the, the best design materials. But the thing, the, the one thing that makes all of those things work is you, the teacher. And even if you do have some of those best design classrooms, those best materials, the best curriculum, if you, the teacher, haven't created that sense of safety in that classroom, none of those other things are gonna work because children aren't going to have that sense of safety that they need in the classroom. So let's talk about if you're a leader and a leader in early childhood, I want you to think about what is your purpose, leading and caring with a purpose. And I thought about this a lot as a center director. And um, I have had a long tenure as a center director and a Head Start administrator. And so when I think about purpose, what I thought about was, why are we doing this, right? What is our vision? What is our mission? But how important it was for other people to be involved in understanding that purpose, that vision, and that mission, and bringing them alongside of me. And quite frankly, I had to do a lot of work in my um, tenure as a leader on emotional intelligence. And, and I owe part of the reason um, that I decided to go back to school and pursue my doctorate degree was because I had a fabulous mentor and leader. And Melinda told me one time, listen, there's no doubt that you can run a program but we got to work a little bit on this emotional intelligence thing, right? And so then I learned um, how important emotional intelligence was. And so I read everything that I could get my hands on. I read, I, I did all kinds of research on emotional intelligence and ultimately went on to pursue um, a, a leadership degree and organizational leadership. And a lot of that had to, a lot of those courses had to do with this very topic. And so when you think about being a leader, what do you think about um, when it comes to the EQ, how you perceive emotions of others accurately? All the, the kinds of things, the interactions that you have with your staff members every day. I think that's important. Emotional intelligence doesn't always have to be with a um, supervisor subordinate. It's in every walk of life. It's in everything that we do. And so I want to share with you this book, another homework assignment, whenever you get can get around to it. Um, if you're an early childhood leader and educator, this is a fantastic book by um, Holly Alyssa Bruno, What You Need to Lead in Early Childhood. And part of the education and training that um, my colleague Jody Martin designed was centered around this book. And one of the things that we learned from that book is she talked a lot about early childhood and it not being the typical business. Because I saw in the chat room 
<laughs> from the previous sessions, how parents confide in you in a lot of about a lot of different things. You are the ones that talk to them when their child is sick, right? It's not this typical business. You're entering into a relationship where you are caring for their most prized possession. And it, it, not that children are possessions, but you're caring for vulnerable, they're vulnerable people. And so what you have to understand is that relationships are truly at the heart of learning, whether it's your relationship with your staff members, whether it's your relationship with other people in your family, whether it's your relationship as a classroom teacher, mentor, or caregiver to the children that are in the classroom, whether it's your relationship as the nurse to the, the patient. And um, I'm, I'm working with my my a family member right now who has a critically ill child and that child has been in the hospital since she was born in December. And we kind of talked about this relationship about how, you know, you want to suggest things as a parent, but you're afraid to because you don't want to hurt the relationship with the nurse. Right. And so for all the nurses out there, the relationship with their patient, the relationship with their patient's family and for the clinicians, the relationship that you have with your client. And so anytime you're in a position of learning, you need we need to remember that relationships really are at the heart of learning. And so what we know, Maslow taught us a long time ago about the hierarchy of needs, right? It's that lowest sense of safety that is important in a relationship. It's that lowest sense of safety that, that is important in a relationship. And we heard um, Marta talk about unsafe families. And so often when we're working with families and when we're in our own households, what we, and I'm going to, oops, I'm going to go back for just a second. Um, empathy fuels connection. This is Brene Brown. And this is your next homework assignment. If you don't have an opportunity to watch it today, I promise you, this is a really good YouTube video and you're not going to want to miss it. This is her um, little rendition of empathy. And I want you to watch it because it really does bring it home. And what she says at the end is she says, empathy fuels connection and sympathy drives disconnection. And so when we're working with our families, I ask you to think about in, in the very beginning, we talked about goals. Are we empathetic? And the reason why you need to think about some of those things is because of the staggering statistics that we have on adverse childhood experiences. 90% of families or kiddos who had been in the juvenile justice system have had multiple traumas at an early age. Some of those people in that juvenile justice system have children that they're bringing to you every day. Some of the families that we serve are from homeless, are homeless and in foster care. Just look at the statistics and think about in your daily walk in educating young children, is empathy a part of that? And so when we think about social emotional well-being and I go back to safety, I ask this question to you. What is social emotional well-being and does it really matter? And I think that we have talked about how much that it matters and how much you matter in the lives of young children and families. So social emotional learning has a, lots of different competencies that are interrelated, right? It's about self-awareness, self-management or self-regulation, social skills, relationship skills, responsible decision-making. And all of these things are taught at a very young age and in that early childhood classroom. The other thing that we have to think about is who we are as a person. And I think about this often when I think about um, how I raise my children. Did I have a good understanding of this as a mother? And did I have an understanding of the, the key 
that self-regulation and how important it is. More powerful than IQ, right? And when you think about self-regulation skills, every one of us out there know somebody who's off the wall smart, but just can't get their life together well enough to do anything with those smarts, right? And so what Dr. Bruce Perry said about educators is that from a child's perspective, every important caregiver and teacher is a potential source of love, caring, comfort, stimulation. But from a neuroscientist perspective, every important caregiver and teacher has the potential to shape a child's future. And I think that is important in any role that you play. You really are shaping that future. And Kathy Fletcher brings us lots of really good opportunities in San Antonio with Voices for Children. And I think one of the things that she does is bring Congress every year. And I, the one of the most impactful presentations that I saw was Father Gregory Boyle when he came and he talked about the work that he does in Los Angeles. And what he reminded me was that, listen, you as an adult can't, if you can't calm yourself down, you're not going to ever be able to teach others to soothe themselves. You've got to go through some attachment repair first. And that was a really good message. And I hang on to that message um, in the work that I do now. And so let's talk about how we all know how important you are, right? It's about creating resiliency and how you're going to have the impact on that child. You're going to, you are that safe place. You are that safe one that, and sometimes when we're that safe place, that's when you see explosive behaviors. And that's a whole nother topic to talk about. But you need to understand that you can work to be that buffer that helps create children's resilience. And I want to introduce you to my granny. And my granny, from birth to age three, was the one that created, helped me to create that resiliency buffer. And um, she took care of me for the first three years of my life. And if it wasn't for her, I go back, I often go back and I wonder, what kind of resilience would I have now as an adult? So why does all this matter to you? It matters mostly because ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, have a lasting impact on your life. It has an impact on you. It has an impact on our providers, our teachers. And so what are we going to do now that we're adults to help us understand this just a little bit better? And then I want you to think about the children that you come in contact with every day, regardless of, of where you work or if you're at home with, with a parent, as a parent, we need to have a perspective shift. And this perspective shift is the shift of what's wrong with you to what happened to you and how can we help. And it wasn't until um, I had my own child that I understood and I went through Dr. Becky Bailey's Conscious Discipline Institute that I remember how important understanding this shift actually was. So we know that every kiddo is gonna go through some positive stress, right? There, there's gonna be some things that you know happen, shots, all those kinds of things that you know happen, tolerable stress. You know, if it's buffered, you can come back from that tolerable stress. But toxic stress, that kind of stress that creates those biochemicals in our brain and um, uh, can actually give them to um, our children in utero. Stress is dangerous, very, very dangerous. One of the best books that I ever read was um, uh, How the Body Keeps Score. To read it if you haven't had a chance. Stress is really bad for our bodies. It gives us lots of bad chemicals that um, do lots of harmful things to our bodies. And what it did for me was this is um, my son who was born uh, over 30 years ago, who was born with a congenital heart defect. And um, he passed away when he was 10 months old. And so this was after several miscarriages that I had. Um, I then got pregnant again with our, our beautiful um, now young adult um, daughter. But what I want you to hear 
is the impact that that stress that that pregnancy had on her. Because remember, adverse childhood experiences occur in the critical first days of life. And so her brain was, she came out wired in that fight, flight, or flee mode, right? She was, she was already in that stance. And I thought it was colic and I tried everything under the sun, um, but it wasn't colic. What I know it now is that stress is really harmful to brain architecture. And so we know that stress in children in, in a classroom and in any environment, kiddos are who are typically developing, they think least about survival. Kiddos who are in trauma think most about survival. That's just kind of how the brain works. And so trauma affects learning over a lifetime. It affects the executive function skills, which are working memory, control, cognition. It really does change the trajectory of the brain. But there's good news. We now know that our brain's plastic, right? That we can change the way that we think about children, but it's up to you to make that shift and that trauma-informed shift that informs you to not think about what's wrong with you, but to think about what's happened to you. And so you can certainly be a part of the solution. You have to understand first that relationships are at the heart of learning. You have to understand just like that toothpaste is gonna remind you every day, you are the person that is the active ingredient in that child's life. And so here's a question on the screen. And what I want you to think about is how do you react? How do children react when you come into the classroom? As a leader, how do your staff members see you? As a professional, how do those you work with see you? And even at home, you're gonna hear Dr. Nadine Burke Harris in that video refer to what if this bear's coming home every night? And I think we heard Marta really bringing that home and how important it is to understand where children are coming from. So we know that typically developing children live in this great a predictable world, right? But if you, they're living in a situation of profound adverse experiences, they understand that the world isn't safe and that they think that it's never gonna get better. And so when you're thinking about the children that you have in your classroom every day, these are the things that you need to think about and what are, how are you reacting to those things? And what we, what we don't understand sometimes are the triggers. And triggers can be internal or external. Um, there's a, another great video called Removed that I show. And um, it, it could be something as simple as a, this little dress that the foster mother picks out. That children who are experiencing trauma or impacted by trauma, they often misread cues. So think about your affect, the, your face structure. How are you, your proximity to children? because they often misread cues. And then in a trauma uninformed environment, we are really trying to think, uh, it's the kids, it's their behavior, who may, how they get so horrible, why are they mis making a mess of my classroom, right? That's a really uninformed response. But now we understand that these kinds of things that have had an impact on them early on it's just this difficulty in regulating their emotions. It's that they don't understand how to do this. It's the trauma and their brain architecture has really um, changed the way that they think and, and operate in their prefrontal cortex. And so you can be a part of that movement. You can begin to think about instead of what's wrong with you, what happened to you? And more importantly, as an early child educator, how can you help? And so who do you need to think about first? You, right? And um, 
we need to advance our profession and become good advocates for what we do every day. And then I want you to always think about this is the ultimate goal. This is the happy and healthy child that you want um, to have in your classroom and in, and in your home even, and how you are that important ingredient. You are the most active ingredient in that particular child's life. And then lastly, I want you to think about what methodology are you using? At Frog Street, um, I think one of the best ones out there, and I, I owe my a lot of gratitude to the work that I do to Dr. Becky Bailey and Love and Guidance and her work in Conscious Discipline, because it was there that I learned how some of the things that I did early on had an impact on, on my children. And so what methodology, and so this is just one of many, remember relationships do matter. As an early educator, you are building brains. You are that brain architect. And again, as Kathy mentioned, um, I'm proud to be the co-chair of the early care and education sector. And this is just a little look of what that sector is. And um, there's the website for the sector down there. And the takeaway for today is you'll be able to consider the importance of trauma-informed approach wherever you are, whether that's a classroom, whether that's an office, whether you're a nurse or whether you're a parent. And most importantly, we need to do something with that. I invite you guys to take a look at um, our early childhood conference that we have at Frog Street. It's coming up, probably will be virtual or hybrid, but take a look. And if you'd like to continue the conversation with me, you're more than welcome to do so and connect with me. That's my, my cell phone number down there, my address, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. But Kathy, do we have any questions? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, so the biggest one, uh, the most number of questions was, can we get a everyone get a copy of your presentation? So I will I'm work say, to do yes. that. <laughs> we will do that. Um, another one actually had to do with uh, what I would think of as advocacy, which is centers take care of so many children who receive subsidies. And given what the state is paying, at least in our state, and my guess is others, um, it's very hard to even pay minimum wage or to do the kinds of things we need to do financially. So um, what do you do? It, that You are absolutely right. It is about advocacy. And I think um, a testament to that is that you started this presentation today with two elected officials. Advocacy speaks loudest when you go through your elected officials. You are constituents. You vote them in office and you vote them out of office. And there is not any better voice to an elected official than their constituent. So if you're not registered to vote and you don't practice voting on a regular basis, all of these things that funding is spent on aren't gonna get any better until, until they start hearing from you. Yes, she's absolutely right. Um, okay. Yes, social emotional intelligence. Question is, many years ago, high emotional intelligence was considered a precursor to standard intelligence. What does the current research say and how can we help parents recognize that social emotional well-being is more important than their ABCs in reading at two or three? So I... I I think I told you briefly about the study that I did with parents and teachers, and, and you're absolutely right. Um, what I think you're going to find when you start doing the work with parents, number one, when you begin to do the work with parents and families, you have to understand how to engage families first. Secondly, then after you've built this um, bridge, so to speak, and how to engage families and, and develop their trust, you really have to start educating them on this. And I'm going to tell you, the presentation that I did for hundreds of families in this particular school district was not much different. It was a little long, quite a bit longer, but not much different than what I did for you today. And I had some, I had one out of an entire audience walk out, they weren't ready to receive the information, right? But the majority 
were ready to receive the information. And the feedback that I got from that particular session and the feedback that I have gotten from the study is that parents do really want to know about this. So you um, have the opportunity to begin educating them with that. And if you ever need any help, I am more than willing to um, walk that path alongside of you. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thank you, Melissa. The only other question, the other question real quickly is what age group do the studies define as early child, early child care? I would guess the first thousand days and then birth to three is the most commonly. What do you, right. what do you see? What do you think? Okay. Right. I, I would agree. And then in our national organization, the National Association of the Education of Young Children, obviously that extends through um, age eight, but you're looking at birth to three will be what matters mm -hmm. most to them. 80 to 85% of a child's brain is wired by that time, 90 to 95% by the age of five. So that's what we need to consider in our uh, profession. Well, thank you so much for Absolutely. sharing tremendous it's been a pleasure. experience and also your own life experiences. Thanks. So, you guys, thank you. everybody stay safe, stay well. Bye-bye. We'll see you in 15 minutes or less. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.